Yeah, sure. So like, I kind of woke up to climate change when I started to learn about veganism, which was about two years ago. And before that, I was kind of aware that in my country, um, we don't really talk about it. It's not really uh, an issue uh, that is present, like present in like daily life because we feel that we're so small that we're not really having an impact on the world. And it's kind of this feeling of being disconnected because we're so tiny. Like my island is, um, there's only 1.3 million people living on my island. So that's not a lot. So like for me, it was really when I started to learn about veganism two years ago. And then I became vegan overnight because I was so shocked by what was happening. And I like had never heard about it. Mm. Yeah, so that was kind of it for me. For me, um, I was, I, there's not a moment that I can pinpoint when I was aware of climate yeah. change because um, it's just kind of always been a reality for me. Um, yeah. Being 17 and living in Seattle, Washington, um, in the Pacific Northwest here in the United States, it's like um, very climate conscious. And also like the Pacific Northwest, there's just a lot of like nature and beauty and yeah. um, around yeah. us, but you can tell that something's off. Like there will be signs on the beach that say like, don't feed the seals, but we haven't seen seals in a very long time. Or there'll be like a lot of orca imagery of like whales that used to like be the, like the killer whales. And now they're all going extinct. And the oceans are acidifying, which is having like a major impact on like the clamming industries and stuff like because we're a sea-based like culture yeah um and so it's like the ocean they're acidifying and it's just messy like the yeah. whole seattle culture is just like messed up um and so that that was always alarming to me seeing like my pacific northwest home deteriorate um but i guess like the biggest wake-up call that made me actually finally take action um it was the 2016 presidential election in the United States after Trump got elected. I was like, well, first of all, the Obama administration was laying a lot of pipeline and like not doing well. So that was like bad. But then we got even worse. Like we sunk to a whole new level of terrible. And I was like, I can't, like, I have to take action. On yeah. This. Um, we, the most powerful country in the world that is contributing the most to the climate crisis, like we're mm -hmm. responsible for this mess now has a climate denying president like I just couldn't yeah so I started taking action and yeah that's that's really what got me involved and then my action just kind of snowballed after um there were two factors in the summer of 2017 there were wildfires so Seattle is like very crisp clean air beautiful fresh like that's like the whole vibe of it and um I never experienced poor air quality where I was from but yeah I did for the first time in 2017 because um there were wildfires in Canada. Um, and those wildfires were unusual. They were caused by unusually hot seasons and unusually um, dry. Uh, and okay. so this, Seattle's like right on the border between Canada. Mm -hmm. and, and so the wildfire smoke was blowing over the entire city and it was like supposed to be sunny, but the sky was gray, just smog. Like it was worse than, like the weather reports were like worse than Beijing air quality. Like, okay. Horrific, yeah. like, yeah. I, got, I got sick like stepping outside like out and it was just like and I'm able-bodied so my friends with asthma and stuff had to go to the ER so that was just like a climate in my face like I couldn't like breathe well for two weeks kind of situation that really just okay. pushed me over the yeah. edge. Okay yeah and that whole like sea-based culture to me is very like relatable obviously because mm -hmm. my country 12% of our GDP relies on the beaches mm -hmm. because of tourism but at the same time this is what is causing the most damage to our country, like tourism and like the tourism activities on the beach that is like driving our like marine biodiversity further away and causing our coral reefs to die. Um, like right now, there's a huge issue with um, the, the, the warmth of the water, uh, mm -hmm. which is causing um, like literally the whole coral reef to die. Right. And it's, it's really horrifying to see because, you know, you can't protect coral reefs directly. You yeah, can't just go there and put something on top and be like, okay, you're protected. Like, you cannot do that. And you can't just, like, give, give them life again. Right. Just like that. Like, it takes so much. And I don't know, like, for us, it's very challenging to kind of get people to understand because we come from such... Uh, like we're such a small country that people they really don't realize that 
what they're doing is actually impacting the world around them. Right. And like in Mauritius, it's strange if you don't like litter. Like it's rare to see someone that does not litter and that does not like just throw their stuff like from outside their car what, while they're driving. Like this is something you see on a daily basis here. So like, like it's not even pushing the government to act. It's like we have to start from like the first like level one educating the people, right. which right. is a huge challenge because we don't have time to do this anymore. Like we have to act. So it's yeah. kind of like a really hard like culture that we have here to deal with. Yeah, that that makes sense. You would think that like in a are you guys experiencing like sea level rise due to like climate? Yeah. So like I know that the like global sea level rise is like two or three millimeters per year, right? Yeah, I think so. And but in Mauritius, it's five millimeters per year in the mainland and nine millimeters per year in our second island. Oh, so that's we have two islands. Yeah, that's insane. That's an insane and, amount. Yeah, and people don't talk about it. And our, like, actually our global, like, our warming of temperatures in January went up to, like, three to four degrees on average, which was quite insane. Mm -hmm. And, like, yeah, we're experiencing very extreme like climate change things but like people just like you know it's kind of like oh it's really hot this year like this is really strange we don't mm -hmm. really experience this but people don't really link it to climate change and their actions yeah like that was happening where everyone's like it's so smoggy like it's so like terrible like I got sick and I was just like, <laughs> like um and the same happened with like a Hurricane Maria. So my, I'm, I was born and live in the United States, but my mom is from Colombia, South America. Okay. Um, and so I have like a connection to like Latin American culture. And I remember uh, before I even went to my family's home country to visit, I visited Puerto Rico. Um, and it was like my first time. I used to like, because in the United States, like, there's like a lot of pressure to assimilate and stuff. I used to be like squeamish and insecure about like speaking Spanish and like being at yeah but then after going to Puerto Rico it was like the first time where I would, like truly felt like the Latin American pride now it's like oh I'm a part of something this is so cool <laughs> I was speaking Spanish and then a few years later Hurricane Maria destroys the entirety of Puerto Rico and it just devastates it and it's just like a supposedly once in a 500 year storm so that hit hard for me because I had memories of my mom and just like connecting and um the media was not connecting it to climate change at all. They were just like, what a strong hurricane. Hmm. And I'm yeah. just like, oh my God. So mm. that's really what fueled me to start the zero hour movement. Um, which was like in the summer of 2017, like after that, plus the smog in like Seattle, it was just like enough already. Um, yeah. So it, I gathered like, I co-founded this organization with like several other young people from around the country and we organized for like a year just building momentum. This was like before Greta Thunberg started her strike, before the extinction yeah. rebellion, before the Green New yeah. Deal. So it wasn't like cool or it wasn't like, um, yeah, like, you know, you, we were very alone and we yeah. were just starting stuff. So there wasn't like this global community that was yeah. easily accessible. Um, so it was really hard, but we organized for like a full year and like the youth climate March on July of 2018 um, was like the first ever like youth official youth climate march. We marched in DC and 25 cities around the world, and that kind of helped spark. Um, and then like a month later, I got a message on Twitter from this girl named Greta Thunberg, um, and she was just like, "Hey, really inspired by what you guys did for like the youth climate march. I'm doing the strike. If you want to like check it out, I sent you an email." Yeah. So she reached out to me, and then we started connecting from there, and it was kind of cool how like that march like kind of helped spur this larger movement because we yeah. felt so alone at the time but like, now yeah. it's so big and like it's really interesting to see how like different movements are kind of feeding into other ones yeah like yeah. even in Mauritius when we brought Fridays for Future in Mauritius then Extinction Rebellion kind of started here which mm -hmm. is like kind of cool but at the same time um, it sometimes feel um like very divisive that we have so many movements and like people tend to show up to only one of them rather than coming to all of them and in a right. small country like Mauritius it really shows because like the numbers are already so small like our first march we got like 250 people which was that's pretty huge. good that's like amazing. this was like amazing for us we were like oh, yeah, expecting good... 25 people that's a good turnout <laughs> for like any event that's a good turnout. yeah 
so we were really impressed but like now then like more movements are kind of you know starting like people are just like you know um kind of spreading among movements mm. and i think that that's a really cool thing that people are able to find their own communities within movements but at the same time i just wish that we could all come together for one big thing and really like yeah. make a bigger impact by doing that. I think there's a problem. The reason why I've noticed this, um, for me, when it comes to organizations, you should only start a new organization if there's a specific gap. So when we yeah. started through our, like there was a gap, there was no like, especially like young women and young women of color led like climate justice organization. Yeah. Youth climate, there was nothing, so we made it. But now I feel like there's a problem where people will just, like they don't realize like you're not like, they'll just keep making things and like making yeah. like more that, that aren't needed. So like sometimes like things are needed, like there's a gap, like, oh, someone isn't addressing this, let's make something. Yeah. But then there'll be like a bunch of people who'll just make like 20 organizations to address something that already is covered. Like you don't need exactly. to cover it. Just to say that I started something and it's a bit like, um, or, or sometimes it doesn't even come from a place of ego. Sometimes people think like, oh, to do something, I have to yeah. start something, which is yeah. not true. Um, and so then that, that's just very confusing and it like divides the movement. Yeah, so. exactly. Do you communicate with like other climate change activists and um, how? Yeah, um, I mean, Zero Hour is like a network of young climate activists from around the country and the world. And so I like, most of them like don't live in Seattle, like actually hardly any of them. Two, yeah. two of us live in Seattle and that's it. Okay. Um, <laughs> So we're all, we communicate over Zoom, like these calls, these conference calls are just like my life. That's how I talk to my fellow climate activists, how I'm talking okay. to you. That's yeah. how I'm talking to like, it's just Zoom, email, text. I'm in a WhatsApp group chat with um, Fridays for Future Latin America. Um, mm -hmm. I connected with some, I was, I was inspired. I just started striking last Friday because um, I was inspired by the Colombian young people um, from where my family is from. And they're striking to protect the Amazon and that just like I always wanted to like connect more to like where my family's from and my home and culture and so like that was like it's been so nice like getting to know these like activists from where my family is from and like um, speaking to them in our language and um, yeah and just having this like WhatsApp group chat of like all these yeah. young Hispanic young people it's just been so inspiring and now I'm working with them to like help protect the Amazon rainforest because that's like the Amazon rainforest are like the lungs of the world. Like if the Amazon yeah. rainforest gets deforested, we're all dead. So um, yeah, it's, that's how I communicate. And it's been really amazing connecting to the global network. How about you? Um, for me personally, I've connected way more with people in Mauritius. Um, that's to be also honest, very like, important. Yeah, like I haven't talked much to people outside of the country. Um, Community is important. Yeah, like I, I really feel connected to the people that I'm working with because we have very similar views on the environment mm -hmm. and how like our approach is very similar in the sense that we really feel like we need to you know bring back that idea that humans belong in nature and yeah. that like reconnect with the environment to be able to you know bring change in mm -hmm. climate change and yeah I, I just and I've met so many people that were really inspiring and that I had like I didn't even know there were so many people in my country that felt so strongly about it and this this really like keeps me going in like waking up every day and doing this because sometimes like I literally wake up in the morning and I just start like crying and I'm like I will never be able to change anything and like we're all that. and like we're, we're all gonna die and no one is listening but then like just like seeing people that um, during the strikes like stop on the street and come ask us questions or like tell us oh like I have been doing this um, let's like keep in touch and work together like that just keeps me really going like that that community that like has that similar ideology yeah for me what keeps me going um, well I was super inspired to start zero hour um, like it's funny how like this chain of like inspiration so like Greta and like the school strikes and stuff were partially inspired by Zero Hour, but Zero Hour was partially inspired by the yeah. Standing Rock movement here in the United States where the indigenous youth, um, and I got to like make, make friends with these young people and they were literally like, they inspire me so much because they face like so much adversity and they literally like put their bodies on the line and like risk their lives to physically block pipelines and like get in the way between like these big tanks and like pretty much the military is like unleashed on these indigenous people. Like, protecting it's the most racist horrible thing ever but they stand their ground with like just such peace and um 
and strength that back in like 2017 when I, I was just like these kids are amazing I want to get to know them I want to be like them um I got to get to know them actually I'm like I got on Facebook messenger and stuff like yeah. and I, at events I've got to speak at events with them like Tokata Iron Eyes, Jason Charger, Danny Grassrope. Um, some of them were actually at the Youth Climate March in DC in 2018 and they just inspire me so much and like recently like Juan and Alejandro from Colombia from Fridays for Future Colombia um, they literally have to face like people like mace them and like have snipers pointed at them like when they're doing like protests and stuff like that like in Colombia there's like a loophole in their first they have a first amendment that says protests are allowed but there's like a loophole that that yeah. that police can go in and like and so they're literally like risking their lives and that just yeah. fills me with so much inspiration and I'm just like if they can do it like why can't I like I have it so easy here yeah um, in the United States well in the part yeah. of the US and if they can do it I better be able to do this and like I feel like this whole thing about like kind of feeling like, like you're fighting against the government in the like when you talked about like how in Colombia like they're risking their lives like even like like for some reason we're not like risking our lives Mm -hmm. Exactly, but like, um, we're not allowed to protest unless we have a permission from the government or like the police force um, of the area. Mm. So that's been a huge like setback for us because mm. uh, for our first march we were allowed to march, but the police was kind of like guiding us around. Yeah, and that it happens here too. For, like five minutes, and then like we like the second march we didn't get like permission to march at all. Mm. Um, which was kind of like it's it's really like discouraging to like have this lack of support from adults around you and people in charge yeah definitely yeah. especially because like like for example with the standing rock thing like they were protecting the water source i can't remember if it's 7 million or 17 million americans <coughs> excuse me i think it was i think the river that they were protecting that the pipeline was going under it's like the water source for like 17 million Americans or so something along many millions of people. Yeah. Um, and the policemen were they, like, they, these people are literally protecting the water of their children and they're fighting against them and like macing them. And I'm just like, we're on, we're supposed to be on each other's side here. Like yeah. the whole point, you know, I see a lot of, especially now that like campaign season is ramping up. Cause like here elections are like all the time, like, presidential elections take like two years it's absolutely insane so anyway i've seen like campaigns ramp up and there are all these like ads where um politicians they always like pose with like kids and they're like oh my god i love my kid like oh look at me with a baby and i'm like yeah do you though because you're kissing them and being like oh that's cute like you're showing very superficial love but you're actively destroying their future and leaving them with the yeah. planet so that's not love yeah and like yeah. For us, it's not even about, like, this type of hypocrisy. It's, like, complete denial. Um, we recently talked to um, the National Environment Fund uh, of our government. So we went to the board and we presented the IPCC report to them. Mm -hmm. And um, they, um, they were finding excuses, like, oh, uh, it's fine, like, Mauritius is small enough to not care about its, like, greenhouse... Uh, gas like emission mm. and uh, Trump and China control climate change and we don't have specialists in Mauritius which is not true like this is a lie like and I know this for a fact because I've been working with specialists and like so many of them like reached out to us and for me it's so sad that you know they they're not like they I don't know if like there's an issue with them trusting the government or if the government is not reaching out to them but there's like a lack of communication between like the scientists and our government at least here in Mauritius and like that's a big issue for us because how can the government make decisions about climate change if they don't have the information and if they only have you know the global um, like reports such as like the IPCC report which does not talk specifically about one country like yeah. I feel like there's this lack of like working with specialists from like at least like Mauritian specialists in Mauritius. Yeah, I think like um, part of that also there's a lot there's like some colonization and like institutional racism there yeah. where it's just like oh don't worry let the big guys handle it. Yeah. And in reality, the big yeah. guys are like screwing everything, and it's just yeah. even if they don't mean to be like racist or something, just like yeah. the way that Latin America, your country, definitely, other countries yeah. are 
approached it's just like we got it don't worry the white yeah. country's got it and it's yeah like, exactly because we got our independence in like 68 like 1968 which oh that's is very very recent that's, that's very, very recent. new yeah who was so, who was who were you guys colonized by the the british the french the all everything <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, but like yeah. no one lived on the island before so it's kind mm. of like it's not really like they did not colonize indigenous people what they did was they um came on the island they claimed it as their own and then they brought people from um african countries and um asian countries like mostly india in asia and to then do work yeah or, exactly or- so basically they brought like slaves from africa and when slavery was abolished they took um indentured laborers from india mm. so that's kind of how colonialism happened in mauritius it's not really like indigenous people but it's still like there's still this big like idea that or oh, the west has it like they've got it all figured out and like yeah. we don't have to worry about anything but we really do because the west is not going to get affected as much as like in the ways that we are getting going to get affected in terms of like rising sea levels like that's right. a huge threat for us yeah the west is the problem and i can yeah. like standing <laughs> where i am in the west i'm like we suck like we're we're causing this and um, there's also like here there's a lot of um in the united states there's a lot of like this is really bad attitude of just like superiority and just like mm. like oh they don't matter like it's just like if america's okay yeah. we're fine and it's just like yeah. this very this kind of patriotism that we're all raised on here where it's just like pledge allegiance to flag with america the army ah uh, and it's just this very hyper like we're floating yeah. kind of thing that makes people like people don't realize the part of the global community and that what we pollute here like causes yeah. horrible effects over there and i'm trying to like work on that and i guess coming from like a where i was born here but my family immigrated i kind of have like a different perspective but it's just like it's very frustrating when you're trying to get people to care like when i try to get people yeah. to care about climate change i have to talk about things happening in happening in the country like where they live or else they just don't care cuz so, like, yeah. oh, that's those countries yeah and it's like and, pretty crazy to go yeah and i i find it really hard to like you know, change the narrative when you talk to different kinds of people like for example for me like climate change is enough but for most people you have to talk about the economy and development and be like oh this is how it's going to affect the economy and development when the economy and development are actually causing it so like in a way like like you don't really know what to say to make them care cuz if you say like oh the system is bad and is causing this well they're not going to be interested because for them the system that is in place right now which is capitalism is the the best system that can exist in the world so that's been like a huge issue at least for me personally because i i've been very confused on how to approach people who like believe in this system yeah actually um the work that zero hour does now is education about systems of oppression that caused the climate crisis in the first place and we've categorized before um this isn't just us coming up to a conclusion like we talked to our friends at standing rock we talked to scientists we talked to grassroots so this isn't us just pulling out something but the four main ones are patriarchy racism colonialism and capitalism um and pretty much how you can't just have climate change and all these other issues separately like yeah the reason why climate change happened is because of colonialism because of I agree, yeah. and because of the current the current way our capitalist economy is set up cannot sustain us for very much longer i know it's hard for people to hear but like when you have a trend line that looks like this where you just have to have more and an earth with a finite amount of resources like yeah there's this great book by naomi klein called capitalism versus the climate um and like a documentary on that and it's just like human it's not natural for humans to be living like this yeah and and like people yeah. are unhappy and the cli- like the planet is dying people are not thriving from it like in no. the end like only a very small percentage of people are earning from this system and it's just insane to me that the 90% that are suffering from it are not able to see how it's impacting them negatively it's because of the propaganda of just like um there's always like with capitalism because it's not like a feudal system where you like stay in your rank forever like there's always that hope of like oh maybe you will be one of the 1% one day yeah. 
And there'll exactly. be all these people who are desperately suffering from this system that is destroying our planet, not working for people, but we should like change and amend because like, this yeah. is, like gonna, we're unhappy and we're going to die. And like what? Yeah. Um, but they're so brainwashed because here in the United States, like there's just this like defense of like capitalism because everyone's scared of communism and people like if yeah. you see capitalism, they're like, oh my God, you want communism. And I'm like, yeah, relax. Like there's, there's a, there's a spectrum here, but they, they just see the two extremes and they're like, yeah. oh my God, you want the Soviet Union? And I'm like, no. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's very hard to convince people because they're also brainwashed. Like they're like, maybe one day I'll be the one who sent and they're all these horrible mm-hmm. stuff. And that's like, not going to happen. It's like, not. And like for us, it's very, it's, it's very rooted in the colonial history because mm-hmm. um, basically people, um, they see um, the, their original cultures, like, you know, living in like small huts and like eating the food that grows in the country and not imported foods. Like right. they see that as like stuff that happens during like hard times or like war periods. So during the first world war and the second world war, that was what was happening. The people did not have a choice to eat like, you know, um, meat or like imported goods. Like my, my dad, for example, he, he did not eat meat. Like he, he didn't eat chicken until the age of like, I think 12 until he could afford it. So people kind of, um, so habits that are actually bad for the environment are kind of linked to that idea of going up in the social scale and the economic scale, which is a big issue that needs to be fixed because there's this one narrative about development that's kind of put out there. And I feel like it really needs to be addressed in order to solve the climate issue that we're having. Yeah. Because if you think about it, like all these like superstars that you see, they get private jets, they have big houses that exponentially increase. Flying is bad for the environment, but private jets, that's just like, like Insane. insane. And so the more you thrive, the more you thrive, the more, the planet gets hurt and that that's kind of but it's thrive because in reality yeah. it doesn't actually lead people to actual happiness it's just like this constant need for more that's not satisfied because our consumerist culture is built on us not being satisfied yeah. and so we're not satisfied we're destroying everything and only a, f- a few amount of people attain that dream um and yeah but the problem is like it's hard to get people for us to step away from that people think that's moving backwards and yeah that's hard exactly thing because they're just like oh you want me to be poor now and I'm like no yeah and that's hard for me because like I enjoy like you know there are a lot of luxuries I enjoy as someone in a western country that are probably horrible for the environment and so it's just like we have to start being willing to sacrifice yeah those sacrifices might even make us happier I agree and like I don't know like especially like for me um it's it's kind of like like, for example, becoming vegan for me was, like, kind of the big sacrifice that I made to, like, kind of pledge uh, something for, like, the environment. And, like, people just really, they, they have a hard time taking those kind of actions seriously because it's hard for them to accomplish them. And I feel like that's where we really need, like, people from different, you know, like, backgrounds and, um, like, educations and um, specialities in climate change movements because we need to address like all those different issues that are not only like directly you know like scientific facts about the climate but really about how people grew up and were raised and like yeah. you know the history and like the culture of the people keep up the good fight and just like changing the culture yeah. like that's really hard but we both have to work on it yeah <laughs> good luck Bye.